so I know we've got some time constraints. So I'm going to move to H145. Um, and uh, there are a number of witnesses that did not get to testify last week. So we do want to hear from them again. And then uh, Martin is going to be sort of co-chairing this with me as um, one who has taken the lead on this bill. Um, but I'd like to introduce Representative Ann Donahue, who also has done an enormous amount of work on this subject and was the lead sponsor of, I think, the original bill last year, or one of the original bills. So welcome. Good to see you. Thank you very much. Representative Ann Donahue, and uh, I just would like to comment uh, briefly on uh, two of the proposed revisions or changes that I've seen uh, either floating around or, it, or in the bill. And uh, I haven't gotten very expert on this um, Zoom yet. I'm, I'm going to, I can't do two screens at once, so I'm going to go to my notes and uh, apologies for um, lack of eye contact or whatever one calls it. So the, the two pieces I wanna comment on, uh, one is the proposed um, addition of the phrase except in circumstances when the use of lethal force is justified, which I believe is a, a Department of Public Safety request to insert in two places um, to make it clear that um, both in terms of the duty to intervene when an officer observes another officer using a prohibited restraint and the um, penalties for use of a, a prohibited restraint. And I, th I think those who were on the committee last year know that, um, that I was concerned about uh, the final bill that we passed, making it clear that um, if an officer is appropriately I don't know if that's the right term, but if the, if the use of lethal force is, is uh, necessary under the standards that then this particular type of lethal force um, it is not part, is not banned. Um, so, you know, I, I think this is about, I understand the law enforcement community wanting to see this very explicit. Um, I, I think when we uh, clarified it, amended it as per my request last year. It, I think it made it legally explicit, but, but not um, explicit to maybe an ordinary person. Um, so I, I'm supportive of the change, except that I think the wording should be different. Um, I think that a lot of what we were trying to do in, uh, in the bill itself was change the concept of uh, justification to um, necessary uh, or objectively reasonable. So I, although I know we do use justified a couple other uh, parts of the, uh, of the language, um, I would prefer to see it saying, except in circumstances where the use of force is objectively reasonable as defined in and uh, reference those parts of the new statute. Um, same concept, um, make the wording more aligned with the uh, intent, intent of the original bill. And the second uh, part is the proposal to add the phrase without the benefit of hindsight, uh, which is in uh, subsection four. Um, and that's an addition uh, to the assessment of whether the decision to use force was objectively reasonable uh, and that it's evaluated from the perspective of a reasonable officer in the same situation based on the totality of the circumstances. And it adds that phrase without the benefit of hindsight. Um, uh, you know, I'm not out and out opposed to it. I'm, I am a little concerned. And the reason I'm concerned is I, I think that the concept that this wouldn't be reviewed um, using hindsight, I, I think that's already inherent in the language. Um, you're evaluating whether that decision was objectively reasonable and from the perspective of the officer in the same situation. And if they're in the same situation, uh, then obviously they don't have hindsight available to them. So, so I don't think it's necessary. And my concern is that it might in some way um, uh, water down a little or lose clarity on the issue that was one of my greatest concerns 
um, in originally introducing the first version of this bill and which I've maintained a concern that it's, it's not really express anywhere. And that is the concept that um, if an officer actually escalates a situation to the point at which it does become objectively reasonable um, to use force, that that should not be a basis for saying that it was uh, reasonably necessary. Uh, so, so I'm a little concerned about um, losing some of the clarity. Um, and I guess I'll leave it at that. I would wanna make sure that we didn't, uh, didn't lose that. And that's all I had to say. Great. Thank you, Anne. Very much appreciate your, your uh, testimony. Uh, Martin. Martin has a question. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. I want to make sure I understood where the, uh, your first comments. I, I appreciate, I understand what you're talking about with, re, with res, without the benefit of hindsight. But the issue about the prohibited restraint, uh, you, were you looking at uh, the new definition of prohibited restraint, or were you looking at a recommendation from Jen Morrison as far as some language? I, I was looking at the rec. Yes, I was responding to the recommendation from Jen Morrison. It's I don't believe it's in your draft at all, but that that recommendation was being made, and and uh, that was something uh, in a course of emails I I was asked uh, about and okay wanted to respond to it. So so. I don't know if you're able to bounce around to another document then, but, uh, but uh, also under my name is uh, proposed new language, uh, H-145, and it addresses the issue that was raised uh, by uh, Jen Morrison, uh, but it, it addresses it with uh, different language. And uh, maybe I don't want to just jump on that right now, but if you can kind of at some point you know, even just uh, an email to the committee uh, to, to give your input. I don't, you know, I want to give you your time to, to take a look at it. Or if we are sure. continuing with uh, additional uh, testimony, if you want to comment on it. But it's, it, it does it a little bit, a, a little different uh, approach, but, but trying to get at the same thing. The same intent of making it, making it clear. Sure, I will, I will look at that um, and, and send, an, send an email. All right, appreciate it. Because I, I am supportive of the of the concept of making it clearer, right. as long as we're maintaining the same um, our same intent as last year. Right. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Well, I, I'm sorry. I did have one more question. Oh. I apologize. Okay. I apologize. Sorry. Um, so the other the other uh, it's not language that you would have right in front of you necessarily, but it's but it's uh, in other proposed change from, uh, from uh, Jen Morrison, and that is uh, in B5, adding the language uh, to the extent feasible as an introduction to that provision. Uh, and I'm wondering if you have any comments on, on that proposal. Can you refresh me on what five goes on to say? Yeah, to sure. Uh, it would be Right now, it's uh, when a law enforcement officer knows that a subject's conduct is the result of a mental condition, et cetera, uh, the officer shall take the information into account in determining the amount of force appropriate to use on the subject, if any. And they want, uh, the suggestion is to put the language to, to the extent feasible uh, at the beginning of that. So, so I, I can also send follow-up notes uh, in writing uh, if I get a chance to look at it, but it sounds to me that again, this is this is an area, um, as with the um, hindsight piece, where that's actually clear in the existing language, um, that it's implicit that it's to the extent feasible based on the way it's wording. So, kind of doubling up to the extent feasible might, um, you know, send the wrong message in terms of. Um, it not uh, losing some of the strength of what's intended. All right, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Ann. Uh, um, thank you. Any, any other hands? So um, let you get back to committee. Great, nice to see you. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, now I would like to welcome Wilda White. Good morning, Wilda. Good morning, committee. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, testify on this bill. My name is Wilda White and I'm the founder of an organization called uh, Mad Freedom um, that's committed to uh, ending the discrimination and oppression uh, against people based on uh, their perceived mental state. Um, I want to, I don't think I have formally thanked this committee for the work it did um, in the last legislative session in, in getting S-119 passed. It was a bill that I was uh, uh, very happy to see passed, uh, actually shocked to see passed, but nonetheless very happy about it. And I appreciate all the work that you did to make that a possible, uh, to, to make that happen. Um, so today I just want to talk about uh, both some of the changes that have been proposed to the bill that are actually in the bill and also based on some of the testimony I heard um, uh, when I listened to the recording last week. The first place I'd like to begin is with the changing the definition of prohibited restraint. So I understand that this proposed change is based on the change, is based on uh, a desire to track uh, the law that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts passed. And I did go and take a look at the law as passed by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It was actually uh, signed by the governor on December 31st, uh, 2020. And the, the first thing I noticed is that the bills, that the Vermont's definition is still very different from the Massachusetts definition. And so if your desire is to um, track that language to get the benefit of an early judicial interpretation of that language, I'm afraid that you would not achieve that result because the language is uh, uh, significantly different. Um, that being said, I do think that the Massachusetts language is a bit more artfully written um, than the, um, the Vermont language, uh, but they do mean different things. And um, if I may, I, I did submit to um, Evan O'Connor just one PowerPoint slide that shows the Massachusetts language and the Vermont language. Um, Evan, can you put that up? Can you share screen to put that up? Or is that something that um, I have to do? I don't want to do it. <laughs> if, I, if I can avoid that, I would like to avoid that. If, but I will if you can't. Is Evan available or? I think he's. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm just pulling it up now. I can do okay, it. There's no problem. Great, I appreciate you. that. So I think it's worth I think it's worth putting it up so you can see the difference. It might be easier to uh, track my testimony. So the uh, top of the, the first definition is the Massachusetts definition and the second, and, and what's below that is the Vermont definition. Um, and, and the main uh, difference in meaning that I'd like to point out is that in, in Massachusetts, um, they, first of all, they call it a chokehold. And they say that if you basically um, limit a person's uh, breathing or blood flow with the intent of or with the result of causing bodily injury and consciousness of death, then you've engaged in this, this chokehold. Vermont, on the other hand, says, if you engage in this maneuver um, and it reduces the intake of air or impedes the flow of oxygen to the brain, then that is a violation. Right, whether or not it results in um, bodily injury or uh, unconsciousness or death, um, that's a, that's very different, um, and it's very different because um, in you know in Vermont, and I and I like the difference. I want to say I like the difference, and I like the difference because um, chokeholds have become for um, black Americans, a form of terror. Um, if you go, if, if you saw any of the coverage of Black Lives Matter protests over the summer, you saw counter protesters reenacting 
uh, the death of George Floyd um, as a way to terrorize uh, Black Americans. Um, and so a chokehold, so it becomes a bit um, irrelevant whether a person has engaged in a chokehold that resulted in death or unconsciousness, because the very act of engaging in this chokehold is itself a form of terror um, for many Black Americans right now. And so I like the fact that the Vermont statute actually pro prohibits, if you read the plain meaning, even engaging in it, regardless of whether it causes harm. I don't know if that's what the committee intended, but that is the plain language of the statute, and that's where it differs significantly from the Massachusetts statute. But what I, when I said I thought the Massachusetts stat statute was more artfully written, I do think that's the case um, because the, the Vermont statute will create a lot of proof problems um, when you actually get to court because it's, 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 it's actually a little too specific. You know, it's, it talks about exactly where you put the hands, the neck, the throat, the windpipe, the carotid artery. That's a really difficult thing for someone who's gonna be prosecuting the case to have to prove. Um, but then you also say it impedes the flow of blood or oxygen to the brain. Again, you've cre it created a, a, a higher uh, proof problem because now you have to get somebody, you, know, you have to get an expert to say that, yes, this actually impeded the flow of oxygen to the brain. And I, I just think it doesn't need to be um, that complicated. Um, so, so I think that's why I, I actually prefer um, the language of the Massachusetts statute. I think it's, it, it is clear, more artfully written, creates fewer um, proof problems at trial if you actually get to trial. Um, and even in considering, in considering whether you're going to bring this something to trial, um, it's, it's, it's cleaner and I think um, uh, more effective in that regard. Um, my problem with, uh, my, so, so then I, and then I want to get into this notion of preserving an officer's right to use this so-called prohibited restraint um, where lethal force would be otherwise um, um, acceptable. Um, this for me raises more of a policy issue. Um, and I would really appreciate some discussion around this from law enforcement. Um, if, if this is preserved as a, um, a tactic that you can use uh, for lethal force, are you going to be training officers to use it? And if the answer to that is yes, I have a problem with that. I have a big problem with, with, with training law enforcement to use something that this legislature has deemed a quote prohibited restraint. Um, if you're not going to be training law enforcement officers to use it, um, I, how do we know that they would be using it in a, in a way that would be um, less lethal than what we consider um, lethal force? Again, I think it's really a, a policy discussion. I think the community would benefit from hearing law enforcement's uh, intent uh, in this regard. Um, and then finally, I think, and I raised this issue the last time I testified on the bill, if you are actually going to preserve this so-called prohibited restraint, um, as a defense, um, as an affirmative defense, I really think it's problematic calling it a prohibited um, restraint. I've tried enough cases to juries and, and, and talked to enough jurors after a case um, where language such as a prohibited restraint would really throw some jurors off because they would say, what do you mean? Well, you're asking me if it was okay for this person to use a prohibited restraint. Well, obviously it's not because it was a prohibited restraint. Um, and so uh, there are jurors who just think that way. Um, and so, it, so I think it would ca cause more confusion. I've just seen jury instructions written like this that just cause so much more confusion um, and they don't really, so the legislative intent is not truly realized. Um, so I would caution you, if you really want it to be something that's an option, that you really should not call it a prohibited restraint. Um, so unless there are questions, I'll just move on to my next comment. Uh, any questions? It's a little hard. Um, folks, if I'm not seeing your hand, please, please jump in. So, so I'm just gonna jump in and ask Evan to yeah. go back to the full, to no longer sharing screen. So, so you, we can see everybody a little better. Thanks. 
So um, th then I want to move on to the definition of a totality of the circumstances that uh, you're proposing to change to add uh, the person or persons involved. I have no objection to that. Um, however, listening to the testimony, I, I do wonder um, if you're going to achieve the benefit you want to achieve by adding the word bystander. Um, that word seemed to create a lot of confusion um, when I listened to the testimony and the questions from legislators last time. Some people were asking questions, well, are police officers uh, bystanders or what about this? And um, you know, any time when there's that much confusion from a, a, a word, it, it gives me pause about including the word. And then when I heard the explanation of what constitutes a bystander, both from law enforcement and others, they were really, in my mind, describing people who were involved rather than people who were bystanders. Um, you know, the, the, the literal uh, definition of a bystander that you would find if you were to, you know, look, uh, for example, in Black's Law Dictionary, it's truly a person who is has no concern with what's going on and who's really simply an onlooker a spectator, an observer, um, someone who's there by chance. And so then when I think about that um, definition of a bystander, it really causes me to wonder, what would a bystander do that would justify the use of force? And, and that's because I don't have a good answer to that question, I'm reluctant to endorse um, the inclusion of that language. Um, when I was thinking about a bystander um, trying to come up with what are you getting at here? When would a bystander's conduct cause you to use a uh, use of force that would be justified? I couldn't think of anything. I, I remember the, the people in, in, in George Floyd um, telling the officers that the person couldn't breathe. Are they bystanders? Perhaps, perhaps they're bystanders, and perhaps the, perhaps their conduct in alerting the officer to the fact that George Floyd couldn't breathe is something that actually would be part of the totality of the circumstances. However, when I heard law enforcement um, explain what they thought about bystanders, they were thinking of bystanders as actually more um, uh, uh, exculpatory, right? It, it, you know, making it their actions, explaining away their actions, um, not actually you know, inculpatory, um, uh, used to just saying that, no, that use of force wasn't justified. So I have two suggestions. One is, I think we need way more clarity about what role a bystander could play that would justify the use of force. And if you do move forward with, it, with including bystander in the statute, I would suggest that you actually include a definition. Um, if there are no questions about that, I'll just move on to my next point. Yeah, I, I have one question on that. Um, if you could respond to this uh, this comment as opposed to a question, that's why I'll, I'll set this up, is that it, it's, it seems to me, and now I'm already being leading in my question by saying it seems to me, but I'll go with it anyway. It, it seems to me that uh, the presence or absence or whatnot of a bystander uh, is readily um, part of the facts that may that are known by the law enforcement officer. I don't think we necessarily lose anything if we take bystander out of, of the totality of circumstances, because it is still part of the facts known to the law enforcement officer. I, if you could comment on my leading question, you don't have to be led, certainly. Yeah, you know, you know, I I'm I'm focused more on, you know. We're talking about bystanders because we're saying they may affect the use of the, the, whether the use of force is reasonable. So I want to know how could the conduct of a bystander enter into your decision to use force? That's for me the only question because um, I can't imagine a scenario where a bystander would affect whether or not you're going to use force on a th on another party. You know what I'm saying? I just I just don't see it. Um, and if somebody gave me a, an explanation about how a bystanders, how somebody standing by would justify the use of force, I might be more able to understand why you would include it in the statute. Until I understand that, um, I'm wary of including these kinds of things in the statute. And I think 
my wariness comes from just my understanding of how the rules of statutory construction. Um, you know, when a court gets your language, they're going to give full meaning to every single word. That's, that's what they do. They want to give full meaning to every single word in the statute. And they're going to think that you have been really deliberate in the words that you've used in the statute, and they will try to give them meaning. And I can't think of a meaning. And, but I know lawyers are very clever. And so um, I, wanna, I want to know the, you know the full impact of this language before I say, yeah, I endorse it or I think it's um, uh, innocuous or I think it's uh, implicit. I, I, don't, I don't know, so I can't endorse it. And I'm more skeptical of it because I know, you know this language in the hands of clever attorneys um, could defeat the meaning of the, of the um, of the statute, but but just if if the vice if we don't have that language in there, conceivably, if in fact it's relevant, which a court would presumably figure out, if the act of, uh, act of a of a spectator, as we will use that word instead, uh, is somehow relevant to whether the use of force was justified or not, that's part of the facts presumably known. So I'm just saying that- I know. would agree with you. Yes, I would agree with you. I would agree that if, you know, facts, we, we, just, can't, we just don't know how, uh, say we just don't know how a bystander's conduct could do this. If, the, if it weren't in the statute, if the word weren't in the statute, the officer would still be able to point to um, the conduct of a bystander in his, in his or her particular instance to say this did affect my use of force, and then it would be considered along with the totality of the circumstances analysis. I do agree with that. Right, because at one point, one of the many versions we looked at last summer, uh, had, we tried to have a list of all the various uh, kinds of known facts there could be. And ultimately we decided to simplify because you're not gonna capture everything. And if it's relevant, it will be brought out uh, in the disciplinary hearing or in the court. So, yes. so that's why we've tried to scale back and keep it as simple. And maybe bystander belongs in that other bucket of, of facts as opposed to something specific in here. All right, thank you. I think that's a better practice of writing statutes anyway to be uh, probably in this case, not try to capture all the facts because the more facts you try to capture, the more the court will consider that this was complete instead of um, just you know kind of a broad, you know what I'm saying? I, I think it's better to leave it, to, to use words like totality of the circumstances instead of trying to spell them all out. Thanks. And then I, I also just wanted to say um, about before the inclusion of the phrase without the benefit of the hindsight, I don't need to belabor this point. I agree with um, Falco Schilling's testimony in this regard. Um, I, I think it's problematic for the reasons that he, um, he, he, he said, um, and that's all I'll say on that. Um, and then I want to uh, talk about the, the um, B5, um, which in the um, suggestion to include the phrase to the extent feasible, um, at the beginning of that phrase. Uh, just to remind you, B5 is that uh, part of the statute that uh, reads, and I think it's important um, to know exactly what B5 says because it says, when a law enforcement officer knows that a subject's conduct is the result of, and it lists, you know, medical condition um, the officer shall take that information into account in determining the amount of force appropriate to use on the subject, if any. Now, when you listen to, when I listened to the testimony last, um, that was given by um, Jennifer Morrison, um, you know, she, she said that it was not always possible to assess the root cause of behavior, or there's not always time to do a laundry list of assessment. But if you read the statute, the statute is not asking for any assessment or any determination of the root cause. The statute says when the officer knows, and it only applies when the officer knows. Um, it's not, and so um, I think that's really important uh, to keep in mind um, 
because it's not asking for any assessment. And, and so the argument that we need to the extent feasible for that reason is just not, it, it's just not founded. Um, but, the, but the other thing that she said that I, I, I found problematic was, um, problematic but also very illuminating was um, in the exchange between uh, Representative Long about um, training. Uh, because she said that she wanted to add to the extent feasible because it's easier to operationalize because they train officers to address behaviors. Uh, and when I heard that, it became more clear to me why we see, you know, 11 year olds being pepper sprayed and five year olds being handcuffed. Because if you're only addressing behavior, then I guess you're indifferent to who's exhibiting that behavior. But it was my understanding, or at least when I was encouraging the um, legislature to adopt this language, was that it was to generate actually a new type of training where we did more than just address behaviors, that if we knew the source of those behaviors, we would take that into account. Um, and so I think this is really a conversation worth having because um, I don't think it is a good reason to put to the extent feasible uh, in the statute in order for uh, the in order for law enforcement to continue to train officers the way they have always trained officers. I do believe that this um, B5 is asking law enforcement to train officers differently when they have the knowledge of why somebody is acting in the way they're acting. Um, and I'm really uh, actually troubled because when the um, in the current draft, the December 2020 draft of the um, statewide policy on law enforcement use of force came out, there appears in that uh, policy the statement, there is not a separate legal standard for use of force involving persons experiencing mental impairment. That is not an accurate statement of the law, um, but it may be an accurate statement of what they want the law to be. Um, and so that statement in the policy, the suggested language about including to the extent feasible, suggests to me that the law enforcement and this committee are not on the same page when it comes to um, what the standard is when the law enforcement officer knows that a person's behavior is because of mental impairment. Um, so I'm very much opposed to this language and very much uh, look forward to a conversation between this committee and law enforcement about their understanding of what this committee has asked them to do in enacting this uh, provision. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Wilda. Really appreciate your testimony, incredibly thoughtful and comprehensive. And, and uh, your slide was really helpful too. Um, tends to be, I tend to be a visual person. But I, I, think, I think it was very helpful to, to many folks. And it'll be great to have it on our website. So thank you. You're welcome. Um, not seeing any hands. I want to make sure I don't miss anybody. Nope. nope. No questions. <laughs> great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, okay, uh, Rob Appel, welcome. So, Rob Appel? You're, you're muted, Rob. Now I'm unmuted and let's see if I can be seen for a moment. Uh, okay. I have problems with my camera and it freezes. So anyway, I appreciate you inviting my comment on this. I'm late to this party as well. I'm trying to follow along with what I heard this morning. Um, I concur with what I've heard from uh, Wilda. Um, obviously, she studied this issue quite thoroughly, including prior testimony, which I have not had the opportunity to do so. I, I am concerned that um, by adding the language proposed by law enforcement, I, I agree with Wilda and, and with Representative Lalonde that um, 
less is more when drafting language. Um, the more you put in there, and I agree with, with Wilda's take on this, the court is going to try to figure out what each word means. So, you know, with regard to um, the bystander language, and I, I'm sorry, I have to flip back and forth, uh, which was section B. Um, I'm comparing what, what's in the bill as introduced with what was posted today by Representative Lilan, and, and I'm confused. Is that Representative Lilan, is this your proposal or the committee discussed proposal? Uh, this is this is a proposal based on some of the testimony that uh, we heard last week, and it's, it's my proposal at this point. It's not the committee's. Well, I think this is an improvement over what is here in, in the bill as introduced. Totality of the circumstances is a term of art known to the legal community and includes any and everything present at the time. I think when you start to try to expand the definition, you're going to confuse judges. I, I agree with Wilda that lawyers from time to time try, try to insert more confusion into a case than that then exists in an effort to benefit their party's position. So, so again, I go, I go back to the less is more, and I, I, I like the language uh, in, in Representative Lalonde's proposal. I question, uh, so that's, that's a substitution for six, right? So what, would, what it would eliminate is persons or persons involved in any bystanders. I think those terms are fully encompassed by the term totality of the circumstances. So that, that's my comment on that. Um, likewise, and I, I, I again agree with Wilda's take that, um, well, similarly in terms of what I would term to be surplusage is uh, in B4 without the benefit of hindsight, any, any case uh, in the federal courts where there's a discussion of use of force, the, the, the case precedent always says without benefit, but without the benefit of hindsight. So codifying that I don't think is necessary. That is the way that judges um, interpret these matters. And, you know, I, I mean, w one thing I would, and I don't know if the committee has waded into this debate yet, but you know, the qualified immunity sort of overshadows all of this. And I don't know if the committee has thought about it. Um, there are other state legislator, legislatures around the country who are grappling with that issue. Qualified immunity in very brief, if you have not, stop me if you're familiar with the term and what it means. Nobody's stopping me, so I'll keep talking. Um, qualified immunity is, it, it is basically uh, a device whereby a governmental official will be immune from any legal action unless their acts violate a constitutionally established right. So what that means in practice is you have to have a prior decision with the facts aligned on all fours in order to hold somebody liable. So... Um, you know, let's say the seven-year-old, the seven-year-old out of control behavior who who threatens suicide with a knife um, doesn't line up with somebody who's a nine-year-old attempting suicide with a weapon. I mean, that would not be clearly established in the views of our federal judges at this point in time, and and that's what the national debate about is about. Um, do we want to be so overly protective of state actors, particularly police, where there is a general principle that is, is essentially um, abdicated because you can't find a similar case with the exact same facts. So I, th I think it's important to be considering these issues when you're trying to um, regulate use of force because unless and until you can find a case that aligns it's going to be dismissed on qualified immunity on motions. You're not going to get to a jury with it. So what, what does that mean to curtail 
um, some police officers, unfortunately, who think they have the right to use excessive force or whatever force they think is appropriate, irrespective of the circumstances. You know, I, I, I think not having that discussion is, is not really discharging what you're trying to accomplish. That said, I'll go back to the language. Um, and I agree. Uh, any questions about that? I, I, I just went through qualified immunity in 25 words or less, which is a very complex concept, but it, it, it's something that overarches your entire work in this area. And you might want to hear from Ledge Council on that or um, somebody who, who will speak solely to that topic with more preparation than I just did. But I think it's important to understand where you're litigating these cases in the civil context, you're going to have, to, as a plaintiff, you're going to have to contend with that concept. I still see no questions or hands, so I'll keep going. Um, oh, actually, I'm sorry, um, Felicia, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm interested on your perspective on whether or not um, amending qualified immunity has a place in this bill, or if you were just mentioning it with regard to how we structure this bill so that it does not um, butt up against qualified immunity and not end up being effective. Thank you for the question. I, I don't think, I don't, I just want you to be aware that the good work you're doing on this bill will likely be for naught if qualified immunity still controls. So whether you do it in this bill or a standalone, I think it's important to conversation that this, our state legislature need, needs to have. Uh, New Mexico is actively working on, on a bill. There are other states, there are other drafts out there. I'm happy to supply it to the committee or, or, or committee council. Um, there's actually a, a, a pretty well-developed national movement to curtail qualified immunity as established by the United States Supreme Court. Um, there's nothing that, to my knowledge, and I've not fully researched the issue, um, that our state Supreme Court has weighed in on, on, on application of qualified immunity, but it, it, it is... Um, Generally, these excessive use of force cases, these so-called 1983 cases, which um, provide civil remedy for state actors violating constitutional rights, are usually litigated in federal court. Um, however, if, if qualified immunity did not exist in state court, you'd see more and more actions in, in, in state court with the purpose and intent of curtailing um, act, state actors who just disrespect and don't follow constitutional mandates. So, so my suggestion would be, um, you know, this is round two of your, your, your discussion on use of force. It's late in the game. Um, I would suggest you have a, a, a committee conversation about qualified immunity and consider a commu com committee bill that would address it. Other questions on that? I, um, just to respond, I really appreciate your response on that. It does spark the question that maybe uh, is better for some committee discussion at a later point of adding in um, that anyone found in violation of this use of force statute is not granted protection under qualified immunity. You're gonna get a lot of pushback. But I am not knowledgeable enough on Vermont's qualified immunity statute to just openly suggest that um, without having testimony and history on it. Um, but it does sound like something that would need to be put in consideration. I don't wanna speak for the committee, but I do wanna speak that it would be my opinion that I would hate to do good work and not have it be effective. Well, that's my concern. And I think you are doing very good work in this bill this year and vote on what happened last year. I just, you know, it, I agree that if, if you don't contend with that overarching problem, this good work may not produce the outcomes that you're seeking. 
So I appreciate your, your interest in that. I'd be happy to participate in that. I, 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 uh, I have worked in this area. I don't know if you know anything about my background, but um, I do bring these cases in, in federal court and qualified immunities. And it's a very difficult hurdle to overcome. And I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Excuse me, uh, Martin has his hand up. Yeah, and I was gonna follow up on, on, on this issue uh, actually. And I know it isn't 100% clear on the outcome. However, by having more uh, well-defined standards and statute, and presumably as we're watching what's developing in the policy, uh, the policy to operationalize uh, the standards that we have here, wouldn't that narrow the opportunity to, to make the qualified immunity defense? I'm not saying it gets rid of it. Uh, I'm not at all saying that, but, but uh, by having these clearer standards, both in, in statute and in policy, it would seem to me that that makes it more difficult for that to be a successful defense, the qualified immunity defense. Is that not the case? Let me think on that a moment. Um, I mean, the, the qualified immunity decisions talk about established constitutional principles. I mean, what, what you're doing is obviously providing statutory guidance. W would that rise to the level of, of um, established constitutional provisions or, or principles? I'd have to think on that. Um, yeah, I, I understand your point and it, it may be of help. Uh, and I, I, and again, I, I go back to my earlier comment where you want to be as succinct and directive as possible without language, which I would consider be surplusage and confusing. Like, let, let me put it in hindsight, uh, you know, bystanders, other persons. I, you know, I, I think you're the, the, the broader, clear language left alone, I think provides better guidance to all concerned. So, so let me just follow up just a little bit on, on this thought again. Uh, what we've been dealing with until recently with, with Vermont's law, uh, with what California recently did, what Massachusetts just did, with, uh, which is, goes into even more in depth. Prior to that, it was really just that this was, these standards were developed in case law. So if, a, if there wasn't cases on point, well then, qualified immunity applied, but here we're, we're putting into uh, effect a statute that lays out those standards and other states are doing that as well. And, and it really, that this is pretty new as far as actually having those statutory standards. But I'll look just specifically at, at uh, the B4, uh, the, which we talked a bit about, uh, Will DeWight uh, talked a little bit about, as far as the law enforcement, if the officer knows Right. Uh, they're supposed to take that into account, uh, and 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 presumably, and, and we're hoping to see this soon, uh, in the policy that's going to be developed, uh, it will it will be talking about all right. Well, if they know about these impairments, here's these steps. Hopefully, it'll involve uh, a lot of the policies that actually were in place in Burlington, but just were not followed in the Grenin case. Uh, but it would seem to me that. It, would be, it will become more difficult for a law enforcement officer to ignore that situation or, or just taking the Grennan situation uh, for a qualified immunity defense to, to be successful. You know, I, you know, I'm speculating somewhat, obviously, because this is new ground, but, but I guess I'm, I'm, my thought is that I'm not, I'm not quite, th I'm not there where I'm thinking what we're putting into place is gonna be undermined uh, by by the qualified immunity defense, and maybe that was there wasn't a question in there. But if you want to comment on, on what I just said, that would be appreciated. Well, what I, I I think it would be best for me to consider your comments and for our interested discussion and provide a response after having given us some more thought and some research. Um, I, I understand your point, Representative Bullon. Certainly, uh, statutory guidance is helpful, but then I talk about and then I think about. Mulder White's comment, having gone through the draft use of force policy, in which, and I agree with her, and if you have a letter in your um, committee folder today from Zach Horsley at Disability Rights Vermont, 
that um, it clearly says that, and I had a case, um, it was a taser death in Thetford in 2012. We got a statement of interest from Department of Justice. It was one of the last acts of um, Obama's, Obama's Justice Department, a statement of interest in which it said that persons who exhibit behaviors that are manifestly indicative of a mental health issue require accommodation. And we'll just take on the draft policy is that the, the, the policy that you don't actually have the ability to prescribe, right? I mean, this is not like, uh, it's not gonna go through the legislative committee on, legislative committee on, on administrative rules. This is, this is a policy as I understand the process that police can write implement and train on. And if it doesn't conform with the law, what, what, what's the legislative's prerogative in that regard? Well, we can come back and be more specific uh, and, and amend the statute uh, next year, you know, or next biennium. Uh, so we, we, we try to have this uh, law uh, setting forth these standards, certainly, but then allowing the flexibility to law enforcement to operationalize them. But that doesn't mean that if, if those uh, policies go into place and, and they really are not uh, operationalizing what we've set out as standards, uh, we can tighten down a little bit. Uh, but that's hopefully, I, I don't suspect that that's going to happen. I, I, I think that uh, law enforcement is, uh, in our conversations with them, really are trying to uh, implement the standards that we have in here. But, but we'll see. Well, I appreciate your continued attention to, to the issue and, and your concern around making sure that your good intents are followed and fully implemented by law enforcement, prosecutors, um, civil litigants, and, and all involved. So um, let, me, let me give some more thought to the, to the broader question and provide the committee with some materials. And I, I, do, I do appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today. If anybody has any further, unless somebody has further questions from me, I'll yield to the next person on your list. Thank you. Uh, not seeing any questions. Okay, so we, thank you. Thank you, Rob, good to see you again. Yeah, like, thank you. So um, committee, we only have about seven minutes or so, um, but I do wanna give Jen Marson um, a chance to to comment um, if she'd like, and uh, certainly we will. I'm sorry for um, the remaining witnesses and, and also Jen that we don't have, um, that we're running out of time, but certainly we are gonna continue this discussion next week. Um, so welcome, Jen, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for your continued hard work on this most important topic. Um, I, I wanted to just say a couple quick things. Uh, I really appreciated the testimony this morning. I took copious notes. Uh, I'm certainly going to be watching this again. I want to reassure uh, Wilda White, anyone else who's watching, uh, the draft, a second draft is forthcoming. We have a very small team of attorneys and two police chiefs, myself and uh, Trevor Whipple, um, who are reviewing every piece of feedback, whether it was an email or the more corporate feedback from Mad Freedom, Disability Rights Vermont, et cetera. And we are really going over in detail the recommendations and the next draft of the policy will reflect a lot of that feedback, not, not all of it. And we'll be keeping track of what parts we use and don't use. We're at a little bit of a crossroads of, do we write a second draft when we don't know what the underpinning legislation is going to say? You know, we're, we're, we're trying to make that decision of do we do I invest that type of uh, time, it, it, knowing that we have all this body of feedback and we're going to incorporate a bunch of it, um, or do we wait until we know what the underlying legislation is? So there is another draft forthcoming, um, and I look forward to sharing that with the uh, interested stakeholders. Um, I also wanted to, to so, so I guess I would ask, and, and to Mr. Appel also, that some trust needs to be extended here, that the Department of Public Safety has made an investment in a position as a policy expert 
to, to have a single person now available, this has never been available before, to have the bandwidth to pull together um, all sorts of different viewpoints to try and create policy for law enforcement. So this is something that is different and new this year. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do my very best to demonstrate that this can be a raging success. So um, I, I look forward to working with, with all the folks who have testified going forward. Um, and I just wanted to also state to, um, that the comment about responding to behaviors was not meant to be presumed as in a vacuum. That's that, the, obviously our training is multidimensional and is based on scenarios and all sorts of context. So while I can understand why review of the, of the video might have caused um, um, Ms. White a, a bit of hesitation around my comment about use of force, we're, we're trained to address behaviors, it's not you know, one dimensional, it's multi-dimensional. So um, I, I did wanna address that. Um, I, I really appreciate all the discussion today. I think that I, I, this morning's the first time that I saw Representative Lalonde's alterations to the current H-145. I certainly would wanna run this over by our legal people, um, but I think, we're, I, I think we're gonna get there. I think that the, what he wrote is not, you know, I don't look at it and go, ah, we can't live with that. But obviously I need to talk to our legal people. There's a lot, lot smarter people involved in this uh, than I am. So I appreciate the continued good work. I'm available anytime for questions or comments from the committee um, or from stakeholders as well. So I'll look forward to, to seeing where this goes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I truly appreciate working with you. And um, yeah, we will get back to it next week. And and, um, and I think Martin will probably address his um, his amendment, but we did not expect you to be prepared for that. So <laughs> don't worry. Okay, um, Martin. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, ask uh, Jen if she, if you could also, uh, I, I don't know if it will come up, but uh, just in case uh, there was language that was proposed by Disability Rights Vermont, which is on our page if you could have looked at that in case, in case we, we do need you to weigh in on that language. I don't know if that's the case, but just wanted to. to... Sure, we have um, our group yesterday reviewed the Disability Rights Vermont feedback. Uh, we broke it down into what we believe are 14 individual comments. Uh, and we made copious notes on whether you know, parts of it will be incorporated into the next one or whether it actually already exists somewhere in, in training um, so I'm, I'll be, I am prepared at any time to, to speak to that feedback. Um, just, just, I want to make sure that I'm clear that this is something that we just received, uh, as testimony on the, not on the, not on the, um, policy, but on the, on the law, on the bill. Okay. And, and it's, a, it's on our, uh, website, uh, t uh, under today's date. Uh, so that's a little bit different. I understand that they did uh, provide input on the policy, but they have provided proposed language, uh, which I don't know if we're going to be taken up or not, but I just wanted to flag that for you so you knew that was there. Thank you. I appreciate that. And also for the committee's edification, uh, I am seeking the assistance of um, a, a, a group to facilitate the um, first attempt to put together that Appendix D. You'll see in the use of force draft use of force policy that there's a placeholder for Appendix D, which is uh, guidelines for law enforcement when uh, um, interacting with a person experiencing or perceived to be experiencing mental impairment. So um, understanding that I'm trying to be a sponge and take in all the info from all different sides of it, I will be uh, using uh, some facilitators to pull together the stakeholders in that and help us build that so that we can provide that resource out to the field. Um, so that is something that the work on that will begin soon, I hope. Great, excellent, thank you. Anybody else? Coach. You're muted, Coach. Sorry about that. I uh, wanted to thank all of the witnesses that participated this morning. Uh, Jen, uh, we really appreciate your work. Um, I would uh, just like to uh, uh, extend um, if we can be of any help uh, in uh, utilizing the communications that we've put together with the affected communities 
in the state, uh, please reach out to Martin uh, and let him know, and we would be happy to help with that. Uh, I think it's imperative uh, uh, that uh, that be done. Uh, and I'm offering that assistance. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. And, and I will go direct with Representative Lalonde to, tr to see if we can uh, develop a list, shall we say, of people to, to invite into the process. Thank you. Great. Not seeing any other hands. Again, thank you to everybody who has testified and my apologies to those who we didn't get to today. Uh, but uh, I forget which day next week, but we definitely are uh, taking it up next week because this is an important bill and want to keep moving on it. So with that, I will adjourn and we will go offline, please. Thank you.